Hey what's going on gamers, if you for some reason didn't watch my last video to the end, you probably missed me mentioning that I'm going to finish the development of my NES game very soon. And for those who misunderstood me and now wondering why I'm still putting out another devlog video, I need to tell that I still have a few things in the game I still need to fix until the game is finished. So it's going to be one or two devlogs including this one and then a final post-mortem video. What if this is the last development log video? Perhaps I accomplished everything I wanted to? Well, let's find out. What's interesting that after I announced that I'm going to finish this project soon, I suddenly became more motivated to work on it. I don't really understand why, I'm guessing it was because now I knew that I have a deadline, so I wanted to accomplish as much as I could until it came. Although it was super hard to finally sit down and record this video for some reason. So the first thing I tried to fix in my game was this problem with the hammers. The game had two different kinds of hammers. A special one that was used to destroy boulders and a generic wooden one that could be used to extract sticks and stones. The thing was, due to the colors in the status bar palette, both these hammers looked the same when equipped. Also, you could accidentally break the special hammer very quickly, and it could not be crafted or received again. So I thought, why the heck I need two separate tools that basically do the same thing? I could just combine them into one. Also, the player should be able to craft this new hammer easily. So first of all, I wanted to create a decent crafting recipe for it. I didn't want to use uh, the recipe for a basic hammer because it also was <laughs> very basic. It was just two sticks. Unfortunately, my crafting system was also way too basic and was limited to only two ingredients and potential combinations of those ingredients that I could use for the recipe was already used up. So how about making the crafting system a tiny bit more advanced? So I added this new option at the bottom of the screen and changed the way the crafting system works a bit. Basically now you can select up to four ingredients and when you want to build your item you have to pick this last combine option if you have selected the right components you will hear a sound effect and a new item will appear i think this is much better than before when an item was made without any confirmation after selecting the second ingredient also improve the way how the game now checks the crafting recipes I no longer have to store all the combinations for two different ingredients in my recipe list. I used to do that almost for each recipe, because I guess I was too lazy to write a proper code. But now I simply could not go on like this, because for a recipe with four different ingredients, I would have to store 24 combinations, which is crazy. So I just had to improve my code. So the new hammer is now the most complex recipe. You will have to combine two sticks, a rope and a rock. Obviously you will learn this recipe after completing the second Erika's quest. The second most complex recipe is the slingshot. I added a rope as the third ingredient. The rest of the recipes are the same as before. Then I increased the hammer's durability so it won't break after few attempts to hit stuff. And also I changed the way it extracts materials. Getting sticks from the trees and small rocks from larger ones is still somewhat hidden feature in the game. Previously I used a pure RNG to tell if a material was dropped, but there were instances where you could swing the hammer a couple of times until it broke and you still didn't get anything. That's obviously unfair, so I decided to drop the RNG entirely for that. If you think of it, it's not a big deal if a player gets, for instance, six sticks until the hammer breaks. Because it's still kinda hard to make a new hammer again. 
Plus, your inventory is somewhat limited, so you can't take all the materials you've extracted. Also, now you will be able to use the hammer in the caves as well, because I've put some mineable rocks in there, so you can make some ammo for the slingshot. Another big problem in my game was with the quests. So imagine you're doing a fetch quest. You bring something to a villager, and when the villager spawns a reward for you, you suddenly decide to go out for a second. Maybe you want to put some of your items to a storage box or something. But when you come back to that villager, the reward is no longer there. That's also very unfair. So obviously I had to fix that. I sacrificed some memory in RAM to store statuses if the item was picked up or not. So if for some reason you don't pick the reward, it will be spawned every time you enter that particular villager's house until you pick that item up. Oh man, how many times I had to do those quests to make sure everything was okay. I had several bugs where one villager would work perfectly fine, but the other would drop a reward for no reason. So I had to repeat those quests like a million times until I got everything right. Also, I should mention that now you can loop the villagers' quests endlessly, which could be a nice way to get some items easier. I think it wasn't possible before because it was broken. Next, I wanted to draw a map of the game world on a piece of paper, just like people used to do back in the day. I just wanted to make sure the world made sense. And also, while having a bigger picture in front of my eyes, I could change something. Perhaps I could move the villagers around and make it, it more interesting to explore the world while visiting them. I started drawing screen by screen and soon I ran into a problem. The location with the Bjorn's house was overlapping with the second part of the dark cave. That was definitely not good. My solution to this problem was to move the Bjorn's location to the left. Now the location has some obstacles in the middle, so you can't reach the house right away. You have to go to the location above and then go down. By doing this you explore a bit more of the location where the mine entrance is. To make the cave map more logical I added another screen to the first segment of the dark cave. I also moved the exit of the mine a bit to the left because it also didn't make much sense in the map. I didn't change the alien base screens that much though, because they were on a lower level, so I let it slide at the stairs that lead into the base and lead back to the mine didn't match that well. There was, and unfortunately there still is, a ton of small issues and bugs I need to fix. Here are a few noteworthy that I managed to do for this update. I made sure that the villagers now reveal all the craftable item receipts, like the slingshot and the fishing rod. Also the note in the mine from John now says that you need to bring it to Eric. I guess now it's less confusing what to do with that note and how to proceed with one of the Erica's quests. But unfortunately you can only bring that note when that quest is active. So I will have to fix that in my next update. I fixed the cutscenes for the PAL version to be the similar length as in the NTSC version. Because they were much longer and probably more annoying. Then there was this task that I didn't think was worth doing. But for some reason I really wanted to tackle it this time. And that's the hints for the game over screen. I can't exactly remember when I saw this first, but I think I was playing the forest and it showed a hint after I died, so I thought I need to add a similar thing to my game as well. I put up 6 one-line hints and tried to display them random. Of course it's the NES and a single line of text can't have that many words, so if you're familiar with my game, let me know in the comments are these hints make any sense to you or are they worthless. Also a funny thing that I had to redraw the game over screen tiles a little so I could use a bit brighter color for those hints. 
Basically it was the reason why I used sprites for the game over letters previously. But after I flipped some colors in several tiles, I could finally use a lighter blue as the second color in one of the palettes for the hints. Then I decided that I need to draw a proper cover art for my game. Most likely I won't be producing physical cottages, but if I did, I would definitely need a decent artwork. I also needed some artwork for my game's itch.io page. I used the title screen before, but it was kinda dull and boring, so I don't think it motivated people much to check my game. I had this cover idea before, so basically now I try to draw a more detailed version of it. I started from a rough sketch, then I printed it out colored it with crayons and tried to put it on a Famiclone card to see how it's going to look. I had to fix my sketch so the elements won't be as spread out as they were. And then I inked the sketch comic book style. And then finally added some colors. This is probably not the final version and I might still change it before I'm done with the game. So yeah, that's about all what I managed to achieve. I still have plenty of things to do. I have about 3 to 6 kilobytes left in the ROM, so it's probably going to be one more video. Unless I won't have anything interesting to show. Then I'm just gonna make the postmortem. As always, you can download the updated game from the links in the description. By the way, what about the name of the game? Should I rename it to Cold and Hungry? Or Frozen and Starving? Or perhaps it's good as it is now? Let me know in the comments. As always, shoutout goes to the awesome channel members. Retro Sorcus, Tim Beimer, Christopher Vigren, Mr. Kesha and Seagreen. Thank you, guys. And thank you for watching this video till the end. So I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.